Digital financial services, known to many as mobile money, will be receiving increasing attention at ITU over the course of 2015. Our work is led by an ITU focus group chaired by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Its aim is to fast track the use of these services to increase financial inclusion. Today almost everyone has access to a mobile phone, but there are some 2.5 billion adults worldwide without access to a bank account. Digital financial services have the potential to bridge this gap, but their use and impact have yet to achieve significant scale. I spoke with some of the ITU Focus Group's participants to learn more about the issues at play and what the group hopes to achieve. So access to financial services is, is important and there, there's increasing evidence that is really increasing welfare uh, if, if it's properly done. But these services are not available just because this, this segment of the population, this, this, the, the poor, they transact in small uh, value. So they transact a lot, but it's really very, very small value. So for the brick and mortar traditional financial institution, it's becoming very, very difficult to think about a business model that could be uh, profitable for them. And uh, the use of the information and communication technology, the use of uh, mobile technologies and mobile devices through which you can pay uh, bills or you can transfer money from one person to another person domestically or internationally is the first step to then bring these people more closely, closely uh, to uh, financial services with the objective, of course, not to allow them to just transfer money because the simple transfer of money and the simple payment is not being financially included. But really as a first step in a, on a ladder, if you want, where in, at some point they will be eligible and they will have access to small credits, small insurance, and small savings. The uh, modern financial system is not working for the poor, in particular not for the unbanked, those without a bank account. That of course applies uh, in particular to those uh, poor people from developing countries, but let's not forget there are also poor people without bank accounts, uh, even in developed nations. But there is a uh, alternative uh, on site and that is uh, digital financial services. It's the answer both uh, because it provides uh, potential to reduce the cost of tiny transactions dramatically, and it also provides a means of transacting potentially that meets the needs of poor people who have uneven income, uneven expenses, unpredictable income and unpredictable expenses and digital offers them a way to transact in the tiny amounts that they have available and uh, potentially uh, to have a full access to a full range of uh, financial services to serve their needs. I think it's important that we have a group specifically looking at this sector. It's an area that we overlooked. The governments thought someone else was doing it, the ITU thought someone else was doing it, but in fact nobody was doing it probably. So the time has come that this group to look at it and see what are the implications, how do we increase financial inclusion, what are the imperatives, what are the rules and the frameworks that cover this. I think that's why it's important. First of all, Russia is a huge country. We have a lot of people who live in remote area, who live in small settlements, towns, villages, with no access to banking offices just because there is no bank offices. Yeah? They can get some services through Russian Post, through microfinance organizations, but still they need more. They need transparent transactions. And here, digital financial services is something that can help because almost everyone uh, have a mobile phone. Not really smartphone, but mobile phone is enough. To do, uh, to do basic transactions. I think it's great that the uh, more affluent countries are recognizing, as I mentioned increasingly, that they also have issues with financial exclusion, and particularly in certain market segments, uh, and are learning lessons from the, from the emerging markets and developing countries. So we thought that it, it was really the time to think about a broader community of regulators and how these regulators talk to each other, how they communicate and how they collaborate to find the right solution for the market to develop. And so the roles and responsibilities are not that clear. And in our perspective, 
more clarity can help the market because instead of having opacity and uh, uh, ambiguity that can lead to arbitrage and inefficiency in the market, having a clear understanding of who is doing what and what are the roles and responsibility for each is creating all, all a, be a better ecosystem and a better environment for the industry, for the regulators, a better understanding of the risk and hopefully uh, a better provision and supply of services for, for the poor, so, which is our target in the end. Thus far, the conversation has been among financial sector regulators and financial sector standard setting bodies. And the exciting development with the formation of the focus group is to bridge what is uh, a, an important to bridge gap uh, between the telecommunications sphere and uh, the financial sector uh, sphere, which uh, is already being bridged by necessity by policymakers at the country level, um, but this is really the first opportunity we have to bring that conversation to a global level. One thing we realized that uh, for the success of this service, both the ICT regulator and the financial regulator must work together. And that uh, where there were overlaps in responsibilities, then we needed to come together and see how we can be able to collaborate in order to be able to ma uh, make the service a success. And we think uh, that the unique benefit of uh, the ITU focus group is indeed uh, that it brings together the private sector and the public sector. It brings together uh, the financial sector as well as the telecommunication sector and really it brings together also developing and developed countries and that we think uh, based on this uh, kind of unique setting uh, we will also be able to look at this kind of new hybrid uh, developments in the field of payment services uh, which are uh, of very importance to achieve the gar target to have transaction accounts for all in order to allow people uh, to safely uh, and efficiently send and receive payments and also to uh, store safely money. And I think it's important to highlight and stress the financial inclusion element of, of, this, of this activity um, because we are not um, there to really develop a digital financial services market per se. We are really trying to understand what kind of solutions could be developed or discussed or, uh, and reach a consensus amongst different players to provide um, market participants, but also policymakers with new tools that could uh, help them advancing the financial inclusion agenda locally. We need to collaborate with industry, with the IT, with the telecommunication, with all these other industries. And th without that, this will not work. And we don't want it to fail because really a lot of things depend on this. It's now uh, almost uh, indispensable. In other words, using mobile phone or, or mobile facilities for financial services, I don't think we can go back. Uh, a lot of people now rely on this. Uh, it's not uh, secret anymore. The whole Somali economy is virtualized. Uh, it's very clear when we look to the roadmap for this project, we see that in some matters the central bank leads because it's financial risks. In some matters the telco ministry leads because it's technological and informational risk. And in some matters we join our efforts. Again, uh, we have to recognize how to work on this together because, for example, a Russian central bank or other financial authorities all over the world, they pay attention and regulate financial risks, but they do not regulate risks of technological issues. They do not regulate, uh, for example, hacking risks in uh, mobile uh, world. And uh, here is a huge potential for cooperation. We need each other. Financial authorities needs uh, or need uh, telco authorities to work on this together. This, this convening power uh, of the ITU, I think, is a, is a great advantage. And in addition, of course, uh, whenever uh, ICT is involved, uh, you would like to uh, uh, benefit from the uh, knowledge of the experts active in the uh, ICT industry. So, of course, ITU has, uh, has a large, uh, big, big uh, expertise in this topic, which can then contribu uh, contribute in solving the various challenging for digital financial services. If we kind of establish, uh, together with standard setting bodies, uh, uh, in the field of remittances, it was the um, uh, Committee on Payment and Market Infrastructures. If we establish general principles, if these principles are then adopted uh, uh, by governments and endorsed also by market participants, that this can really uh, contribute and increase uh, the benefit and efficiency uh, for the individual customer.
Uh, when the service matures, uh, the need for regulations and policy direction becomes very important. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think at the start, uh, had we put that in place, it could, could have been the uh, big hindrance towards the rapid growth of the service. In, in some countries it does hinder, and it's an interesting point to elaborate. You see, one reason that mobile money worked uh, better in, in developing countries might actually explain what's going on. In other words, if you look at Australia or the U.S., for some reason, mobile money didn't take off, for example, as fast as in, in Kenya or in Somalia. And the reason is because the rules are rules. They're very rigid and they're very formalized, and the parliament and the governments want to know what's going on. Whereby, in developing countries, the technology just took off. There was a need for money and liquidity in the economy, and people just said, how do we do it? If it's by mobile, let's just do it. Let the governments and the politicians catch up when they wake up one day, which they did ultimately, and now we have to legislate, literally working backwards. We, we, we have few challenges. One of them is probably unique to Somalia. This is uh, the violence and the, and the terrorism and so on, which is diminishing. Uh, those, uh, um, I guess, distorted young kids are now no longer uh, powerful and they're marginalized. But on the other hand, there's uh, another problem that we share with the rest of the world, which is how do we create the necessary legal framework to manage two industries that somehow got converged. Uh, you have the telecommunications sector and the finance sector. And all of a sudden now we have those two becoming one, where you can do your voice and data as the old way of using mobiles, as well as using that for financial services. Now the question is, the, the, the politicians and the governments must move fast enough to come up with the necessary legislations to rule this area, to actually say, how do we manage this? How do we govern this? We have come up with a method of trying to ensure t a, a tight a, a kind of uh, regulations that would enable those who access the service to have been properly identified and registered so that uh, whatever SIM card that is being used uh, in the transaction of this service must be with somebody who has been properly identified, who, ha who is within the government registration system. Of course, uh, those who, who come uh, into Kenya from foreign uh, countries and want to use the service within the country, uh, of course we use their passports and we identify them with their passports as, as one of the key components in, uh, in identification process. So this has helped to reduce. But even after saying that, um, the aspect of uh, undemanded laundering, well, is a very wide subject and uh, I don't think we could uh, easily be able to say we have eliminated it. There are also uh, technical challenges. Uh, for example, suppose you are subscribed to an operator in your country, but you would like to send money uh, to someone who is subscribed to another operator. So how, how do you ensure interoperability or going even a step further, suppose you have someone working in a country, uh, outside your country, and the person would like to uh, send money uh, to his or her family. Is that, uh, is that possible uh, using, uh, using mobile devices? So these are also some of the te technological questions. We're still trying to figure out where we will end up, but I am optimist. I think the way forward is through technology, not just because I'm a technologist, I was involved in the industry, but I can see uh, already the, 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 the light. I can see where we're going with this. So with a small footprint, in other words, with the governments doing as little as possible, in other words, to just to make sure the rules are working, this will continue and it will develop the national economy. It's already difficult enough sometimes to get agreement, to get a consensus within the ICT industry for, for standards and for agreement on best practices. It does add a level of uh, complexity if you have another industry sector, but that's, I think that's just the way it is and uh, it's, a, it's a challenge and I think looking forward to contributing to solving this challenge.